Well, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Couldn't have wrote it better myself. <laughs> and just so you got a little bit more background on me, uh, yes, 20 years of regulatory experience in the state of Arizona uh, and 17 years in Arizona exclusively, but I dug my first hole in a Yukon mining camp in 1969, so that might give you a little bit of idea just how long I've been around in this industry. I am actually pre-code, <laughs> so, which is in itself is a little bit scary when I really think about it. Uh, but when you find something that you really have a passion for and something that you really enjoy doing, it's hard to get out of this industry. I did retire. I was gone for two whole days. I retired on a Friday, drank a six-pack of beer, watched the Vikings, and then went back to work on Monday morning for Veriforce, and I haven't regretted a minute of it yet, so operative word there is yet. <laughs> and today we're going to go over some of the history of the operator, qualifications and rule, uh, where it came about, why it came about, and you know, have a discussion, I, I hope, as the day progresses on where that rule is going to be going and how we can make improvements and how we do our business every day because the one goal that we all have here is pipeline safety. We all know that the economics of safety can't be beaten. When you keep the product in the pipeline, when you keep your customers safe, when you keep your employees safe, it's better for everybody, it's better for the industry, it's better for you as operators. So that's always been my focus and that's really what keeps me involved in this industry today is that hopefully we can all still make a difference and working collectively, we'll be able to make it a safer, better industry every day. So moving into the presentation, we're gonna be covering the history of the operator qualifications rule, the overview of the current OQ rule and your role in that, in that, in that uh, operator qualifications, and PIMS's enforcement and consequences for noncompliance not the least of which is failures of the pipeline system. But there are other consequences. So, starting in 1992, in January, while a crew from a utility was doing a routine annual maintenance on a uh, monitor, worker monitor regulator station, high pressure gas, they overpressured the system, uh, uh, and that overpressure continued for 45 minutes. And as a condition of that, the pipeline failed. It leaked through gas appliances within several homes and other buildings. Subsequently, there, was, there were explosions and fires killing four people, injuring four others and damaging 14 houses and three commercial buildings. You know, as we all know, whenever there's an incident of that magnitude, Congress is gonna get involved and Congress in this particular case did. And the Congress focused their attention on operator qualifications in the Pipeline Safety Act of 1992. Now, they, they, uh, now this amended the Natural Gas Pipeline Safety Act of 1968, which was the original Pipeline Safety Act. And the Pipeline Safety Act of 92 launched provisions to require the testing and certification of all individuals responsible for the operation of pipeline uh, pipeline operations and maintenance, and to recognize and, and react appropriately to abnormal operating conditions. Now, to, to boil that down, we had a lot of people out there in the, in the pipeline gas industry that weren't necessarily trained to do the job that they were doing. A lot of it was hand-me-down information from one operator to another. My own personal experience as, a, as an inspector was I was out on a small transmission operator and it was a very similar situation to, to what happened here in 1992. And this was after the rule was, in, was enacted. And I was witnessing or verifying some of these qualifications at a worker monitor station, similar to this. They got about halfway through their operation and I noticed that while I was monitoring the gauges, they were getting dangerously close to their MEOP. And they were about to exceed it when I finally shut down the operation because the gentleman did not have the training and the knowledge of that particular station to do the work that they were doing. So, now, so in 1992, Congress came in. In 1994, RISPA, which is now FIMSA, RISPA was the Research and Special Projects Administration for the Federal Arm of Pipeline Safety and DOT, and they proposed rulemaking in 1994. 
In July of 1996, ERISA withdrew from the NPRM because of the comments that were being received from industry. PHMSA, RISPA had their idea of how everything, they wanted to see it done and industry had their idea. So what happened is that on the same day the agency announced a plan to form a committee to achieve consensus on a new proposal for a pipeline personnel qualification rule, uh, they, and like I say, they received 131 comments to the original proposal. And on the same day, they uh, announced that they planned to form a committee to negotiate the many aspects of the new issues and to achieve consensus on the new proposal for a pipeline personnel qualification program. So they pulled the rule and immediately went to committee to try to come up with a negotiated rule process that everybody could live with and that industry could live with also. In 96, the Accountable Pipeline Safety and Partnership Act came into play. That was part of the 1996 reauthorization. And then in April, the negotiated rulemaking committee began their work in 1997. And in 98, the new notice of proposed rulemaking for OQ was put into play. On June 10th of 1999, again, a 16-inch diameter steel pipeline ruptured and released about 237,000 gallons of gasoline into a creek that flowed through uh, Whatcom Falls Park in Bellingham, Washington. And we know the results of that. There were three fatalities. Uh, there were two 10-year-old boys that were killed in that incident and what they refer to as an 18-year-old adult, and I don't think that an 18-year-old is an adult. So there were three children that were killed in that incident. Part of our responsibilities in Arizona, we had a play in this because we, were, we did an evaluation of, the, of what transpired, and we were part of the investigative group that was looking into what happened at Bellingham. And the, the results of that was that it was completely preventable. Had there been a, an, a quality assurance program or quality control program, had there been proper training, at the time that the incident, uh, prior to the incident occurring, there was damage. The utility company didn't take the proper actions to oversee the, the work that was being done. The pipeline was damaged, and ultimately it led in those fatalities and the release of product. Now, the NTSB, in their evaluation in 2002, determined that the accident, the probable cause was as I stated, and in all likelihood, it would have been able to withstand the increased pressures had they not had that damage to the pipeline, so that incident would never have happened. Following consideration of comments reserved by the National Pipeline Rulemaking, the committee reached final consensus on the final rule in its last meeting in February 1999. The final rule for qualifications of pipeline personnel was published on August 27th of 1999. And an effective date of October 26, 1999. The rules governing transportation are contained in Title 49 of Code of Federal Regulations, Volume 2, yada, yada. We all know where they're at. And the new rule con 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 created a new subpart N for 192. So we have the rule in August 2000. Again, we had another incident, and that was in the Carlsbad, New Mexico. And again, in this case, there was a low, low spot in the line. There was corrosion on that line. The line failed, and we had a large number of fatalities that were involved in that incident. In 2002, the rule became effective. Congress further amended the pipeline safety laws in 2002, including the requirements that operators of pipeline facilities adopt and implement a written verification program that ensures that all individuals performing covered tasks are qualified. The law specified minimum elements for each such program, including the requirement that they contain a periodic requalification component. And it gave certain directions and discretionary authority to the Secretary of Transportation, including direction to verify the compliance of an operator's qualification program and to develop requirements for certifying individuals who operate computer-based systems. Now, currently, PHMSA has issued a new 
OQ and PRM back in July 2015. And it was determined that existing regulations were not prescriptive enough. NTS findings and safety recommendations. Uh, gaps between the current OQ requirements and observations during audits and inspections in the field, and key elements missing or need clarification. Uh, comments that have been received through September 8, 2015 from utilities and pipeline and 25 other concerned agencies. So OQ changes placed on hold until 2017. At well, first, there have been a number of incidents in recent years in which human error has still been a factor. And this has led FIMSA and NTSB to decide that there has been a need for some changes in the regulations, which prompted the driving of the NPRM. Now, in addition, based on FIMSA's discussions with industry, stakeholders, gaps have been identified where the OQ rule and actual operations in the field. Although many of these issues have been dealt with in a revised ASME, B31Q standard on pipeline personnel qualifications, it was determined that FIMSA should amend the OQ. Current OQ rule overview. The OQ rule requires effective companies to identify the covered tasks and abnormal operating conditions, requires the company to implement a process for evaluating personnel, requires the company to develop and follow a written qualifications program, and to maintain records to document compliance with these programs. As regulators, those are the records that they're looking for when they come out and conduct their audits to make sure that the program is being followed and that the program is comprehensive and addresses everything that it should. The intent of the EOQ is to ensure a qualified workforce on regulated pipelines and to reduce the probability and consequences of pipeline accidents, incidents caused by human error. Over the years, as I was doing our investigations in Arizona, uh, and also in our association with the federal government, we find that there's still a continuing need for operator qualifications diligence. Although that the number of incidences, human cause, has been reduced, it's still out there. And here in the last few years, there actually seems to be an, an uptick in those uh, number of incidences that are occurring. So due diligence, is a requirement of OQ, evaluation. You need to continually look at your programs. In today's world, if you're not moving forward, you're losing ground. So that was something that we always tried to drive on the regulatory side, was continue to improve, continue to evaluate, and make sure that you're looking at your programs for their effectiveness, and that they are doing the job that you want them to do. An integral part of the OQ rule is to cover tasks. We all know about the four-part test, and with that four-part test, that cover task is it performed on a pipeline facility? Is, an operations, is it an operations and maintenance task? Is it performed as a requirement of Title 49-192 of the Federal Pipeline Safety Regulations? Is it required? And does it affect the operation or integrity of the pipeline? So every function of operations and maintenance that occurs on your pipeline, you need to look at it and give it this four-part test. And if it meets that four-part test, then you have to have our, our operator qualified personnel performing that task to assure that you don't have any issues and that the people who are performing the work are fully trained and understand what their responsibilities are while they're performing that task. Abnormal operating conditions, AOCs, Qualified individuals must be able to recognize and react appropriately to an AOC. Recognize, be able to identify a situation or event on a pipeline that is out of the ordinary and could become a hazard to the public or environment if not properly corrected. Your staff needs to react appropriately and know what to do to ensure that the hazard is promptly addressed. And this can include notifying the employee supervisor or site inspector or taking the correct action to mitigate the hazards, whichever is appropriate for the AOC. Numerous times in my, in my job, in my position with the Arizona Corporation Commission, my staff and myself have identified numerous times where we go out and we do interviews. We do field evaluations of those people as they're performing their tasks and functions out there. And all too often we find that they do not understand what the AOC is. 
They don't know what reactions or they don't know what actions to take should it be identified. And if you don't know what an AOC is to begin with, you won't have any reaction to it because you won't recognize it for what it is. An AOC can be simply, I've got cathodic protections that are below what they need it to be. You need to conduct an investigation. You need to react to that. You have pressures that, although they may not exceed your MEOP, they are not as they should be. You should be able to recognize that as an abnormal operating condition and begin your investigation process to determine why is that pressure higher than it was or higher than it should be at this particular station. Do you have uh, worker monitor stations that are out there? You may have a, a worker that has a bad boot, you have erosion, and your monitor is now taking over, so you've got that increase in pressure. That's your first indication, but if you've got a technician out there that doesn't recognize what that pressure differential is, then the next thing that fails will be the boot on the monitor, and then you have an overpressurized system again. So, you know, if you don't recognize what the AOCE is, if you don't fully understand what is involved in an AOC, it can lead to some very bad things occurring on your pipelines. So it starts off as simple, could have been corrected, but instead it escalates and now you have a failure on your pipeline. Who must be qualified? Companies must ensure that all individuals who operate and maintain pipeline facilities are qualified to perform that covered task. That is your responsibility. It starts with your own employees, your qualified employees. And you also have to qualify your contractors. And if your contractors are hiring contractors, their subcontractors also have to be qualified if they're doing work on your pipeline on a covered task. Now, who is ultimately responsible to make sure that the contractor and the subcontractors are qualified? Who's the, yeah, who's the, regular gonna, who's the regulator going to interview, and who's the regulator going to write the NOV to, and who is the regulator going to find? You the operator, nobody else. When I, would, when I would be conducting an investigation, usually an after action, something bad happened on the pipeline, they tell me it was a contractor, I tell them no, it was somebody that you hired, they are your employee, they are your staff. I don't need to talk to them, I need to talk to you. So there is a failure in your operator qualifications program, there's a failure in how that person was qualified, there may be any number of issues, but it's still going to be falling on the operator and nobody else. Always keep that in mind. You, cannot, you can delegate the work, but you can never delegate the responsibility that goes along with that. It always falls to the operator. Operator qualification requires a written qualification program, including seven basic core elements. You must identify cover tasks to be included in the qualification program. You must ensure through evaluation that individuals performing covered tasks are qualified. You need to allow non, you can allow non-qualified personnel to perform a covered task if directed and observed by a qualified individual. And I want you to pay attention to two words in that particular sentence, directed and observed, and while that task is being performed. That means I need to be in direct control of that person who's doing that task. It's not a supervisory tool, it's a training tool. So span of control, observation, and direct is a training tool, not a supervisory function of OQ. And there's always been a little bit of confusion there because contractors and, and I'm not trying to pick on contractors, but historically contractors are the ones, I've got five guys, I've got one qualified person, and I got a lot of work to get done today, so I'm gonna watch five guys, or I'm gonna watch three guys. But can he really direct, observe, and take control of that situation while he's observing those people? If I've got three guys coding a pipeline, can I see all three of them? while they're performing that task at one time? I don't think so. You've got people on both sides of the pipeline. You may have somebody behind you. What happens if that person who's doing the observation has to take a break, walks over, takes a phone call? What should happen to all of those people that he's observing? What do they need to do? They need to stop. 
If they don't stop, then they're not being, they're not falling within the span of control and there's a violation. Usually when I walked up on a construction site, it was pretty easy for me. If everybody was not qualified on that job site, it was pretty easy to me to find the, the low lying fruit, some of it just falling on the ground, pick it up and write the NOV. Because you can easily watch somebody walk away from that span of control and they do it all the time. So again, vigilance on your part will pay off in the long run. But it's not a supervising tool, it's a training tool. Evaluate an individual if there is evidence that the individual's performance contributed to an incident or accident. That's another hard one for a lot of operators because what happens is that you get complacency. It's hard to disqualify that person that you've worked side by side with for the last 20 or 30 years. It's hard to write up your best buddy or your son-in-law or your best friend, but it has to be done. If they're not following the operator qualifications rule, then they need to, you need to do your job and you need to disqualify them, get them the training that they need, and get them back to work, but get them back to work safely. You need to evaluate an individual if there's evidence that the individual is no longer qualified to perform. Uh, maybe he fell out of qualification, maybe expired his time span, maybe he had an injury and he was off work for an extended period of time. Now when he comes back to work, is he truly ready to go back to work? And, does he have the knowledge, the skills, and the ability to perform that job, or should he be requalified? Should you be taking a look at his qualifications? Can he still do that job? Because you have to have the ability to do it. You don't want somebody out there doing valve maintenance who doesn't have the upper body strength to manipulate the valve. So these are the things that you need to consider when you're looking at qualified personnel. You need to track your management of change so that any changes that you make to your operator qualifications program is relayed back down to those people who are actually in the operator qualifications program, who are performing those covered tasks. So changes in your plan don't do you any good if it's not communicated to all the people that that impacts. Uh, Requalification intervals, you have to do your diff analysis, Make sure that your people are getting qualified within a required time span. You need to spell that out for each of the covered tasks. It takes more than just saying every three years, every five years, every two years. Have, some, have, have a reason for that. Is it difficult? Does it, do they do it frequently? Uh, does, you know, how serious of a safety issue is it with the pipeline? How critical is that function? Uh, we know that welders have to be qualified every year. We know that joiners need to be qualified every year. That was to make sure that they kept up on their certifications, that they were doing the job that they were paid to do and they're doing it correctly. And, you know, those rules have changed a little bit, especially with plastic. Now, if you have any failure in any fusion, you have to get requalified. Used to be you could have up to three mistakes a year. So, and then record keeping. Always records, records, records. As an, as an inspector, as a program manager, as that person who was responsible for assuring that operators were doing things the way that they needed to do it, the only thing that we have to go by as auditors, as, as regulators, is the records and documentation that's provided to us. You can have the best program in the world, but if you're not tracking it, if you're not keeping records and documentation, the only thing that a regulator can do is write the notice of violation because we have nothing to go on. Although we always believe everything that we're told, we still have to verify everything that we hear. So trust and verify. I was never out there to call anybody a liar, but there were times where there just wasn't enough documentation to tell that I could stand up and say, yes, this company is doing everything they're supposed to be doing. You know, the, the story I like to tell a little bit is that, you know, as much as I love my dad, if my dad didn't have the right documentation, I'd write him up in a heartbeat. And I know he wasn't lying, but he didn't have the documentation. I'll keep that philosophy. Span of control, we've talked about that. No one can perform a covered task unless they are specifically qualified to perform that task or are directed and observed by a qualified individual. And that's only if your plan allows for span of control. So if you haven't written it in your plan, then it's not allowed. And, and as, as outlined in the OQ plan. A span of control of one to three would mean that one qualified employee could direct and observe up to three 
unqualified employees. But again, they have to have direct observation. They need to be able to take control if there's a problem. Three people for one person is really hard to control. It's herding turtles. And you've got to be able to react to everything that they're doing in real time, not after the fact. You can't let them make the mistake. You have to stop them from making the mistake. You have to interrupt that process so it doesn't become a mistake. So be very, very digital, diligent in your span of control. Enforcement and consequences of noncompliance. One of the last actions I took was writing up a company on some operator qualifications in Arizona. That was $85,000. That was just a little state issue. It's very pricey not to comply with the regulations. During inspections, FEMSA and state agencies can review records of any operation or maintenance activities. For covered tasks, this includes qualifications, your evaluation processes and methods, and the date that each individual was evaluated. Again, this is all going back down to records, records, records. Uh, inspectors seek to ensure that each in individual is qualified prior to the performance of specific covered tasks on an operator's pipeline where I really looked hard at operator qualifications is typically after a reportable incident. Everybody who touched that pipeline is going to be evaluated. Uh, we're gonna be looking for the documentation. If you cannot connect all the dots, you can expect bad things to happen. The Pipeline Safety Regulatory Certainty and Job Creation Act of 2011 increased the civil penalties authority of FEMSA to a maximum of $200,000 per violation per day, up to $2 million for a related series of violations. Now, most of you are probably under the jurisdiction of your states and not FEMSA directly. States, for the most part, have all adopted the $2,200,000 rule by, by, uh, by agreement with FEMSA. States have some latitude. Uh, we operate under a, uh, a certification program where we have guidelines that we have to follow in order to, re to remain or to keep our certification and to do those inspections. So part of that is adopting current rules and regulations and incorporating these fine levels into our own, own processes. But understand, that's, that's only the minimum. States have the, also have the ability to find whatever they want to find for any incident at any time. And if you're going before a commission, if that commission is political, they may want to make a point. They may want to drive an issue. Makes them look good, public's happy. Unfortunately, you, the operator, are going to suffer the consequences of those political actions. Uh, I'll use our, our left coast partners as an example with their commission. Uh, most recently, there was a, an incident with unqualified personnel taking cathodic protection ratings. That's a simple function. That's a stick and read function. I went out there, I put my half cell in the ground, I looked at my meter, and I write down the read. But it's a covered task. $5.4 million. That's a lot of money to go out there and take reads because the people who were taking those reads were not qualified to do it. Their qualifications had expired. It was a contractor that they hired to do that but who's responsible? Think the contractor paid $5.4 million? No, the operator paid $5.4 million. Now, some other examples, back in 2009, an operator failed to identify a covered task, a threaded fitting assembly. $133,100 was the fine for not identifying a task. 2010, an operator did not enforce a span of control properly. $100,000. 2010, operator allowed unqualified personnel to perform covered tasks, $271,300. Another one in 2010, operator failed again to identify a covered task, mud plugs, for any of you guys that do liquids. Uh, $788,000. 
you can see that there's a consequence for having unqualified personnel doing the work that a qualified personnel should be doing. There's consequences for not identifying a covered task as being performed on your pipeline. In addition to civil penalties, this can also go and lead into criminal penalties. And again, California companies are under that scrutiny. And just from the, uh, you know, from a series of incidences that have occurred out there, there are people that are looking at criminal prosecution. And any person that willfully and knowingly violates a pipeline safety requirement is subject to a fine of not more than $25,000 for each offense, imprisonment for not more than five years or both. So if you know you're doing something wrong and you still choose to do that, and somebody wants to press that issue, which PHMSA is more than willing to press that issue, especially in today's environment, you could be looking at real live jail time. You could be looking at more than just fines, loss of your freedom. Now there was a point in my career where I spent 14 months going to jail every day working on their gas pipeline system, replacing their entire infrastructure of pipeline. I can tell you, I was on a catch and release program. I could go in and go out every day. And it is still the most depressing, disheartening place you ever want to go. So don't do it. Don't go to jail. Do the things that you're supposed to be doing. Now, additional fallout actions, and we've all seen these, a number of issues can occur. You can have lawsuits against your company. You have lawsuits against individuals involved. We've all seen the negative publicity in the pipeline industry to date. Nobody needs any more of that. Increased scrutiny from the regulatory agencies. You know, if as a regulator we had an issue once, that's fine. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody's got things that fall through the cracks. But if you do it again and again, now I'm going to tear your system apart. Now I'm going to find out why is this happening over and over again. This has now gone beyond the one-off. And now this is systemic to your, to your program. And I want to make sure that we cut it out and that it doesn't continue throughout the rest of your, your program and your operations. And then again, like I said, criminal penalties, including fines and jail time. And for those of you that are regulated for rates, you also know that there's that other little tool that the commissions can and do impose on a regular basis, and that's you're not going to get money in your next rate case. And that's really going to impact your bottom line. That's really going to impact your shareholders. And that's also another tool that a lot of state regulators use uh, in rather than imposing fines, will ask you to take corrective actions and whatever the cost of those actions are, you will not be able to get recovered from the ratepayers. It'll have to be recovered by your shareholders. So there's lots of ways to get to your bottom line under penalties that, you know, PHMSA doesn't have that ability, but states certainly do, and those are the people that you're dealing with on a regular basis. They can impact your rate cases. So always keep that in mind. There were uh, any number of incidences where I did not levy any fines whatsoever but I did get millions of dollars recovered that didn't go back to the ratepayers. That's my presentation.